So let's quantify. We're going to talk about forgetting economics as you know it. So that college class that you probably couldn't stay awake, we're not going to talk about those things. That is based on the Stone Age, effectively. And when I say that, back in the Stone Age, we were doing hand tools for farming, hand tools for everything, hand tools for mining. We didn't have enough stuff. And therefore, we lived in poverty, had health problems, et cetera, et cetera. The answer was more. If we could invent more technology, more efficiency, we could solve those problems. So now, as we advance to the day now, we have effectively answered many of those equations. Let's think of it. We think of this story as the human, uh, the human story is kind of like this circle here. It's everything we're doing, we can measure economically. The goods and services we produce, the things we build and aspire to, it's this human story. Now, what we do is we talk about it all the time. We talk about economics all the time in a common way. We push it inward. And we do it through that kind of dirty word called politics. We shrink it inward. And what's happening there is we don't have food, clothing, and shelter endemic to the human experience. We still have to struggle for that even nowadays. Even though we've engineered the solution, we struggle to, to come up with enough of it for ourselves. And so when we push it in, we debate about two opposing forces. On one hand, we have freedom, and on the other, safety. So we tend towards freedom. We prefer to be left alone until something happens. And then we say, I, I can't defend myself on my own. Let's introduce some regulation to be safe. Then regulation eventually may lose its purpose. It gets a lot of hand, and we say, I'd like my freedom back. This pendulum goes back and forth. We, there is no final destination for humanity for this pendulum. It will keep moving. The best we can do is have an efficient way to move it around. So all we're doing there is we're still stuck in a fear model. We're still stuck in a model based on we don't know how we're going to ensure getting our needs met. What I'm going to propose we do is step out. So instead of stepping just to the human story, we're going to step back even more and say, where does that come from? Why is everything we know about economics the way it is? So let's talk a minute about money. Money effectively, as it represents to each and every one of us, is about two things. It's safety. It's a buffer against volatility. And on the other hand, it represents potential. So we, in theory, if we have enough money, we can go do the things we want, have the things we need, so on and so forth. In theory, we could buy happiness with it. So if we call it a tool, if we say it's like our toolbox, then let's look at an, a master craftsman, a master sculptor. Do we measure that sculptor by the size of his toolbox or how much tools he has, or do we not instead measure really by the sculpture? Maybe 0.1% find the tools interesting, but the rest of us look at what a woodworker does, a craftsman, and so forth. So as a society, we're fixated on the toolbox. We've locked our potential up, and we measure that as, as stored potential as success, not unlocked potential. So the question is, where does this come from? Where does this thinking come from in a deeper end? We're going to look at a few charts, and, the, and before we look at the first one, understand over the 20th century, on average, scientific knowledge has been increasing. So each year, if, say, we produce this much scientific knowledge, on average, the next year will produce somewhat more. The thing about science is we don't spend it. We keep it. We share it, and we leverage it, and we build upon it. So as that science increases, this is what it looks like. This is a 42-year period of time, from 1970 till 2012. This is what the average American worker produces when they go to work in their 40-hour work week for the year. We've adjusted for inflation, all sorts of other things. This is not what people are getting paid, it's what they produce. This is what your 40-hour work week translates to. And you'll notice it about doubles over 42 years. So it's a powerful component. The American workers doubled what they produce, goods and services-wise, over a 42-year period. Now, the interesting thing is what it does to poverty. It's trendless, 11 to 15%. You can't really pick one way or another. It oscillates around. So despite a doubling in our ability to produce resources, we have the same official poverty rate. Now, we're going to compare that to another culture. We don't have a chart for it. But in the year 1500, archaeology has shown that the Mesoamerican cultures were more sophisticated than we thought. So in North and South America, the pre-Columbian, uh, the pre-Columbus discovery of these cultures, they had sophisticated empires. And in the Inca Empire, they had very different ways of doing things. They didn't use money, and they had a zero poverty rate. They had no hunger. And so when I bring this up to scholars, they say, well, if you have an abundance, of course. They kind of scoff and say, dismiss. If you have too much food, you can give it around, and that works. Well, the charts we just showed in America, we have more than enough stuff, physically speaking, engineering-wise. And yet, economically, our system doesn't have the same result. Now, the point is not to debate the methods of the two. It's the concept, where does it come from? Over, these were two dynasties of thinking. The Western European dynasty of economic thinking started in Rome and back and weaseled its way through Europe and eventually came to America. The Mesoamerican cultures, it's still up in the air exactly where they came from, most likely the Orient and the South Pacific. They spent 
extended periods on their own in the North and South American continent, developing very large cities. Archaeology shows us that a brief window, they were very sizable. In fact, Mexico City may have been the largest city in the world of its time around when Columbus discovered it. Nonetheless, these are two dynasties of thinking. When we compare the two of them together, we see they're as different as can be. And so where that comes from, of course, is the mind. We look at the economy. We think the economy is imposed upon us as though we can't change. It's almost genetic. When we show just a few thousand years of human history, maybe centuries of, di of difluence, and suddenly we have a very different way of thinking. So now a question comes up. Let's say we are going to radically change things here in the, in the Western world, the developed world. We're going to completely think of doing things differently. What are some things that would stand in the way? Well, we'll talk about perception. I'll preface it with, uh, this is a framework. We're going to show some charts over this. On your left is the negative. There's no data here. This is just on the left here would be negative information. On the right would be a, a positive. You can think of an IQ bell curve being overlaid here, where common's in the middle, less than average is on the left, higher than average is on the right. We'll overlay a number of things over that kind of a framework. So we go to the $5 equation. So let's imagine you're walking down the street in Napa. You find $5. You go, woo, free latte. That's about it. <laughs> After about an hour, you have the latte, you toss it out, and you're done. You don't think about it again. That $5 means nothing to you. Now you're walking down in Napa, and someone literally steals $5 out of your wallet, and you see it, and they run off. Well, this is a totally different scenario. Now you're angry. You're scared. You file a police report. That's a, probably a felony here in California. <laughs> you may be asking, can I walk the streets of Napa anymore? But notice something. You didn't ask when you found the $5, do people no longer value the dollar? Are we having a massive inflation? You just took the five and ran. Now, science has answered exactly what's happening here. And there is a difluence in the response. It's an average. There's a range of studies. And the average comes back about 11 to 1, meaning that $5 being stolen hurt 11 times more than finding $5. And it looks about like this on the chart. So if we follow our feelings and say, let's feel our way through the economy, this is what we're going to come up with. Studies show it. Most people don't like their job. Most people don't like their bosses, prefer they'd stay out of their way. An extraordinary amount of people live check to check. People aren't happy about working in a cubicle. They just do it because they have to. That's what their feelings would be. Now, if we stopped here at our feelings, we'd continue with this answer, and we'd continue in the same cycle we're in. So the question is, if you strip the feelings out, what does it look like? Positives and negatives are at equal. You say, that's kind of audacious, isn't it? Well, th if you think about it. And it's easy to understand that we keep positives. We don't let them get too out of whack. So in the stock market boom, the real estate boom, people rushed into those trades, took whatever money they could until it was done, and we don't let it last. But in negatives, think of identity theft. At first, we got all scared this whole new idea about 10 years ago. And now we have identity theft protection plans, insurance. We have all sorts of services and whatnot. It's kind of like a wobbling orb. It's trying to keep at equilibrium. It's called market efficiency. It's been, that's been known for a while. So think of if you're buying a house in a neighborhood. Someone has to sell very quickly. They cut the price to get out. That's the first house that sells. We don't let that last. That doesn't change the dynamics of the neighborhood. It's the first opportunity taken. So this kind of wobbling scenario is what our risk-adjusted economy looks like without feelings. Now, this model works on industry levels, companies, markets. I'm going to walk through an explanation of how this risk works on an employment basis. So you'll first notice we quantify in the middle that hourly employment is the most common. We have the most of it. And it's easiest to find. As we go further out, we'd have salary. And we note now what's starting to happen with things. The risk is getting higher. A salary worker, in theory, has to go to school pay some money for a college degree that they're paying out in advance, they're working for free for a number of years learning, then they can apply and see if it works. So now we have, we're introducing risk into the equation, so therefore we have less of these, they pay more. We go further out, we have small business owners. These people can make a million dollars in a year. They can work the very same hours in a recession and lose everything, including the, their house with a personal guarantee. So now the volatility gets even higher. There's even less of them. You're noticing something, though. The impact is getting higher. The further out, these people have the potential to begin to influence the economy. The last category, I call it risk capital. There's no one person. This could be a venture capital fund. This could be a corporate R&D department. This could be uh, Mark Zuckerberg inventing Facebook 14 years ago. These are things that change the world. The probability of them happening is so extraordinarily low, it's unlikely, and therefore we don't do them as part of our daily living. We're too scared of them. We kind of go towards the middle. And the question is, what drives this distribution? Well, two, we notice two things here. There's a blue line got added over the quantity. 
that is probability. So it's very probable common things will, are, will happen. It's very probable everyone here that has an jo hourly job tomorrow will go to work, will not get fired, and won't get in a car accident. However, what does that mean? More than likely, someone with an hourly job spends a good portion of their day simply paying the bills for that day, maybe has a little shred of their workday left over. Do they change their life? Do they change the world? Probably not. And as we get further out, of course, we get all the way out into the innovators, the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates. Those people completely change the world with a small act. And so the question, of course, is what's all this mean to adjusting our view of the economy? What we showed up here were some simple things. We went from the initial, we took our conversation that what we do when we shrink it to, to safety and freedom politically, and we said, okay, let's take some feelings out, redact the feelings, let's take a lens off the camera and see what we really see. And now we're, we're introducing a few things. We're introducing fear, risk, some probability and impact. Those things are ultimately guttural. They're not very complicated. That does not explain why a starving artist will starve and, still, and with an, a viable job opportunity continue to paint and flirt with not getting their needs met. That doesn't explain the full gamut of the human experience. This is just another layer of survivalistic mentality. What it proves is we have a fear-based economy. As long as we have embedded into the economy the fear of our food, clothing, and shelter not being met, we will continue to follow this methodology. It is not that this model is imposed upon us genetically. It's not that there's nothing we can do about it. It is a result of how we've chosen to think. And this model could be changed into anything the human race wishes to choose based on how we think. So the, the, in order to graduate from the baby steps, of obsessing over production, we need to take things a step further. We've already literally engineered those equations. The Inca Empire was using hand methods for farming, draft animals. They didn't have any of the agri-tech we have. If you think 300 years ago, you couldn't get an orange from Florida to New York City reliably in the winter. Now we can have an orange almost anywhere in the world. We can have orange juice fresh and shipped all over the world. We have 500 plus years of advances, and yet we still are looking to the equation of producing more and more and more. Again, we've literally engineered those equations. To <clears throat> take the next step, in order to be able to, uh, to make a fundamental change in human purpose, we have to step back and understand why are we so married to survival? And secondarily, the, the economic challenge facing the human race is what about how we think prevents a wholesale change in human purpose? Thank you.